Grace be unto you and peace from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the sermon this morning is based, uh, again, on a text from the Gospel according to St. John. Uh, the passage that immediately follows the text we had last week, which was verses 1 to 14 from that 14th chapter. This is starting with verse 15. And just a reminder again that the Gospel of John was written uh, as the latest of any of the books of the New Testament. It was written uh, around the turn of the first century. It also was written out of the life of a particular small community of people of, who were followers of Jesus who had been excluded from the Jewish synagogue in their community. They were not only excluded, they were being oppressed and sometimes even persecuted because they chose to follow Jesus. They were Jews, as the early Christians, most of the early Christians were, but they were excluded because they decided that as a part of their Judaism, they would follow Jesus. It also must be remembered that John is written in a different style than the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is always regarded as its own independent kind of literature, a kind of literature with which you and I are not very familiar and with which we are not even really comfortable because it's mystical, it's spiritual. In fact, John is usually called the spiritual gospel. It is a whole way of thinking and of knowing and of communicating that's different from the way that most of us Westerners communicate and think. So we have to kind of use a little bit of imagination and creativity as we read, and it's rich reading, wonderful literature, but it doesn't always click with us as the synoptic gospels do. So this one today, this follows immediately on what we had last Sunday and begins with the word if. Jesus is quoted as saying, if you love me, you keep my commandments. I've been thinking about the word if. It always seems like it's the prelude to some kind of a deal. If you will do this, I will do this. How about it? Or it sometimes is a, a, a promise. It's kind of like the way my mother used the word if. If you do that, you know what will happen. Yes, that's true. Um, but it's a kind of a, a, a word that, uh, that can be also very misleading. We use it sometime in our theology, in our understanding of God, in God's work in the world in Jesus Christ, that if you have faith, God will love you. No, the gospel is God loves you. Receive that love with faith. We do not qualify for God's love by having faith. It is not if, as soon as you add if, to anything in talking about God's love for us or for the world, we've moved away from the idea of God's grace. God always acts first. It's not that God will do something if we do something first. In this case, if, if is used to indicate something that automatically kind of follows. If you love me, you keep my commandments. It flows. That's the way it is. It's simply saying faith, if you are love for Jesus, is not something that is simply emotional or a feeling. It is not a thought only. It is both feelings and thoughts. But it always leads to behavior. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Love is always expressed in behavior. Love between husband and wife is that way. I tell Joyce that I love her. 
that I feel love for her, that I think about loving her. But believe me, I'd better show it in behavior. It better make a difference in the way I live and in the way I express that love for her. That love is something, finally, that we do. It's behavior. And so it is with this quote from Jesus in the Gospel of John. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. It's not a command, it's an observation. And when he talks about his commandments, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are old, primitive literature, and their main purpose was not, first of all, to give a set of ideals to the people of Israel. It was the symbol of a contract between God and Israel. When Moses received those commands, that's what it said. God says, I will be your people, I will be your God, you will be my people, and this is the contract we have. You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not take my name in vain, and so on. The commands of Jesus go far beyond the Ten Commandments. In fact, uh, recently, you know, there's been in the news the story of the judge in Alabama who, in fact, ended up being fired from the Supreme Court because he insisted that there must be the Ten Commandments on a memorial or a monument in the lobby of the courthouse. The United States Supreme Court said, no, that, is an, uh, that is, would be considered a, a breach of the idea of separation between church and state. And what everyone thinks about that, I wish that rather than it being the Ten Commandments, why wouldn't somebody think about putting up like the Beatitudes, for heaven's sake? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when people persecute you. And all those, a little more difficult kinds of things, but more reflective of our faith. What are Jesus' commands? What are the commands that if we love him, we will keep? The primary one when Jesus was asked was this. They said, which is the greatest commandment, Lord? And he said, easy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And a second is like it. And the word there in the Hebrew is even closer than that. It says, and it's, the second one is the same one as. It's right on top of it. And your neighbor as yourself. You can't love God without loving your neighbor. That's the primary one. Love for neighbor as an expression of love for God. But then he spells it out. I think especially in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount or in Luke in the, what's called the Sermon on the Plain where he takes first of all the Ten Commandments and he says things like, you've heard it said, you shall not kill. One of the commandments. But I say to you, even if you are angry with your brother, you violate this command. And if you come to the altar with your sacrifice there to offer your worship and you realize that your brother has something or your sister has something against you, go and first be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your sacrifice at the altar. That killing is not just killing. It is the way we treat one another. It has to do with relationships. We are made whole by our healthy relationships. Therefore, if there is discord with anyone, you make amends, apologies, or whatever is necessary to restore the relationship. Then he says, you've heard it said, is in the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. Okay. But I say to you, Jesus says, Anyone who looks with lust in his or her heart has already violated this commandment. It's much more than just, in fact, the first commandment when it was said in the Decalogue and the Ten Commandments, 
It was really a property violation. To commit adultery was to violate the man who owned the woman, and it, he, she was his, regarded as his proper, property, and adultery would be a violation of him rather than of her or of oneself. He expanded. He went beyond the Ten Commandments as he made his own commands. And then he said things like, Judge not, that you be not judged. Be sure to take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I hate that one. But it's there. Uh, It's hard, therefore, to criticize other people or to decide what their worth is to me because I don't know the story. Or he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what it said in the Old Testament. But I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies. Actually, he says there, you've heard it said, and it was this way in the Old Testament, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. Those are commands of Jesus that says, if you love me, this is what you will do. And then he has commands like, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where rust and moth consume and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth cannot destroy and thieves cannot steal. Make life meaningful, he's saying. Don't just live day to day. Have purpose. Have a mission. Have a ministry. That's what it means to love Jesus. Those commands of Jesus. Some of them get kind of uncomfortable. If you have plenty of this world's goods, Jesus says, and your neighbor has not enough, give him what he needs. Hard to define. What does that neighbor mean, Jesus? And I'm afraid what the answer might be. Anybody in the world of my children that is in need is worthy of that gift. And he says it in Matthew in another way. He says, if you want to minister to me or in my name, feed the poor. Give water to those who do not have clean water to drink in the world. They're thirsty. Visit the sick, the imprisoned, the lonely. Because he says, when you do that, you're doing it to me. That's where I am in the world. These are the commands of Jesus. And at the end of this text, he says the same thing when he says, those of you who know the commands of God, of my Father, and do them. If you know those commands and do them, my Father will love you. My Father does love you as you do those commands. That's that's the deal. That's the bargain, that when we love Jesus, what we're saying is, we will follow your commands. And then Jesus makes the promise. And and by the way, notice how he then says, I will send to you the spirit of truth, an advocate, the spirit of truth. That if, if there's anything that the people who love Jesus have a passion for, It is the truth. Living in a world of spin and consultants and advertising, who knows what the truth is? We prefer lies to tell them and to hear them. But we are convinced as the people of God that we will settle for nothing less or more than the truth. What is the truth? In whatever area of life one wants to apply that, what is true? 
It's the spirit of truth that God gives us and sets us apart in all of these different ways from the world. And he says the world just does not understand that. The really, what Jesus is saying is, if you love me, there will be something about you that sets you apart, that makes you different from the conventional wisdom, that makes it somehow, or as St. Paul says, you are a peculiar people, but a people destined by God for good works. The spirit of truth will be given to you. We've had a wonderful speaker at the Senate Assembly this weekend that's actually having its last worship as at this moment over at the Hilton Hotel on LBJ and the Tollway. Our speaker was Tony Campolo, who's on the, um, he's an Italian Baptist, who's on the faculty of Eastern University outside of Philadelphia. And he's been uh, giving, he gave us three speeches that had the place just electrified and excited as he spoke, as he has, I've heard him before and as he always does. And he was reminding us of the difference between the people of God and the rest of the world. And I was always asking myself, okay, Ray, how does that, how are you different? What makes you different from so many, from the people around you who are not part of the kingdom? That's, that's, that's a tough question for me. But that's what we're about. And he was telling us we are to be different. We are to be peculiar. We are to be strange. And to follow the commands of Jesus make us that. And to have a passion for the spirit of truth. So when we come to this place, we come here to worship God and to glorify God. We use the words of love. We love God and we love Jesus. The one who reveals God to us. We're called also then as an expression of that love to obey his commands. The commands that he lived in his own life and that he calls us to follow. Amen.